Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mead Russert, Managing Director of Automated Logic and Director of Advantech Americas at UTC Building and Industrial Systems. Thank you. Okay. At United Technologies, we believe that the future of green buildings will be determined uh, by what we do next with knowledge, data, and collaboration. United, United Technologies is very proud to sponsor this master series, Transforming Markets Through Data Collaboration. We believe data drives decisions, and that's just fundamental. You may know many of our building technology brands, from carrier HVAC systems, Otis Elevators, Automated Logic, Building Automation Systems, Linnell Security Systems, Edwards Fire and Detection, and so on. What you may not be aware of is our history with the green building movement. Carrier was the founding member of the USGBC, and we continue this commitment today, continuing to found green building councils around the world. Why? Because we believe in the green building council model around transforming markets. We think it's important and transformative. We can look at the green building movement the same way we would construct a building. Knowledge serves as the foundation. Okay? Data can provide the framework, and collaboration is the cement that holds it all together. So we must spread our knowledge, share information with more building professionals around the world. Here, education plays a key role. Again, why we're here today. Okay? Smart buildings will be formed using data, intelligent data, so building owners can make intelligent decisions. We are doing this with building automation systems today that optimize the operation and efficiency of the many systems in a building, like HVAC, elevators, people movement data with security, fire systems, and so on. We challenge the industry to go faster just as we are trying to do ourselves. For green buildings, data means the demonstration of value. The data is there, it's been demonstrated over and over again through many studies. So green buildings are smart business decisions. The environment and the economy must win together for the movement to grow. And finally, collaboration, which is why, of course, many of you are here today. We've grown uh, because of our collaboration in the green building movement, all of us together. We have to continue to learn from each other and that's why, again, we're very proud to sponsor this master series. This master series helps provide context for transforming the market through data collaboration. So enjoy the series. I know you will leave here prepared to do just that, to transform the market through data collaboration. Thank you and enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Marianne Lazarus, AIA resident fellow at the American Institute of Architects. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, standing in for Robert Ivey, who's the CEO of AIA. So imagine me as Robert Ivey for just a minute. Uh, unfortunately, Robert couldn't make it at the very last minute. He sends his deep regrets. So hello to everybody here um, on behalf of the AIA, and welcome to Transforming Markets Through Data Collaboration at Green Build 2014 in New Orleans. I'm honored, it's a great place. I'm honored to join you all and to be part of this exciting glimpse into the future of how we will make decisions about building materials. And I wanna recognize first Mahesh Ramanajam and Chris Pike, who you'll be hearing about from in just a minute, as well as everyone at USGBC for this event. Not just for bringing us together today, but for all the hard work and leadership as we move towards a shared vision of a more sustainable and environmentally friendly design and construction world. Today continues a lively conversation that started at AIA uh, convention in June in Chicago called Data Jam that was co-hosted by AIA and USGBC. How many people were at that event? Everyone down here, that makes sense. And there, after discussing the data-related challenges facing builders when choosing materials, 
we identified opportunities to drive large-scale data transformation across the design and construction industries, and we encouraged everyone there to unleash their innovative potential. And today, we're going to see the successful fruits of that initial brainstorming, and I'm really, really excited to hear what we're going to find from that group. And it's particularly important because architects representing the AIA, as I am today, uh, have a growing importance. As much as we've been part of the build, green building movement for the last decade, even more importance in understanding green, in choosing building materials and making the tools and resources available so we can do that effectively today because it's critical that the design professionals make sure that the environmental and health impacts, the life cycle analysis and, and the embodied emissions are all part of our conversation when we are making material selections and decisions on our projects. It's particularly relevant since the AIA uh, is fully committed to making these kinds of resources and knowledge available to the design profession as part of the repositioning initiative that I've been engaged with them as a consultant for about a year and a half. They are de developing a roadmap for equipping, equipping architects with the tools they need to make important practice decisions, very on the ground decisions at the project level and help them get ahead of the curve in transforming their practices. Through education, engagement with industry supply chains, other means, we want to promote building materials that protect human health and benefit the environment. And we want to work with industry advocates like USGBC and others today to increase that quality and amount of information. We envision supporting those resources and are really excited about what we're going to see. At AIA, we call our effort Materials Matter. And you can, maybe you can't see, but I've got a little badge on that talks about that. So thanks again to USGBC and everyone here for partnering with us in these very important endeavors. And can't wait to see what you have to talk about. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mahesh Ramajam. Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Green Building Council and President, Green Building Certification Institute. Good afternoon, everyone. This is an exciting topic for me. Um, transforming markets through data collaboration is a great topic for our uh, master series speaks, uh, speaker series here because it highlights uh, innovators and thought leaders from our industry, the green building industry. It speaks to the focus of companies like United Technologies, who understand that real change is always driven by a desire to build a better future backed by evidence-based results. It speaks to organizations like AIA and their thousands of architects who walk the fine line between form and function in ways that deliver beauty, health, safety, comfort, and security to those of us who use these buildings they create. Today's discussion will focus on the health and environmental attributes of building materials. This diverse group of experts are on the forefront of making the data accessible to the market, relevant for designers, and meaningful for the people who live, work, play, and enjoy these beautiful environments that we create. This is a very critical focus for USGBC on a day-to-day -day basis. And as a former IBMer, my passion to data is immense. And I can tell you, we are already doing some extraordinary things and seeing possibilities to aggregate and analyze data. Six years ago, along with Dr. Pike, we talked about how do we liberate the data and today, we are having an ongoing conversation about how data can be aggregated and analyzed. So this is very exciting. But data is not information. And information is not enough. In today's world, you need the knowledge that lurks in the data. And the best way to get it is through collaboration. Collaboration with companies like UTC, organizations like AIA, and within the large and talented community that makes up USGBC. That's a lot of what we are going to see today and hear today. So it's my pleasure to introduce our moderators for today.
two brilliant and talented colleagues of mine at USGBC, Dr. Chris Pike, our VP of Research, and Dr. Ashley White, Senior Research Fellow, Dr. Pike. All right, now the fun part. <laughs> so great. So I want to. Um, it's my job. It's my job, my responsibility to segue from the the organizations that got us here, and, and with the greatest appreciation for UTC, for Google, and for Mahash and for Marianne, who have kicked us off and explained why the work we're doing here today is so important to each of these organizations. And I get to do something fun. I get to, uh, to introduce the first panel of folks. And so let me explain how today is going to run. And so well, the way that we're going to work this, and so first and foremost, um, this is a celebration. We are celebrating people who are helping us realize the vision that is laid out in things like Lead Version 4. We are literally celebrating people who are making it possible to understand the health and environmental attributes of materials and to bring that information into decision making. That's awesome. And they're literally making it possible for, for us to raise the bar on the industry and for the industry to respond with better products that benefit both people and the environment. So that's, that's what I think we're doing here. Okay, so with that said, the way this is gonna roll is that you guys are gonna have the benefit of, 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 of a series of lightning presentations. And the following folks are gonna come up here one after another and they're gonna give three, max five. If they go over five, we start to get scary. And they're going to explain some really key points about what they're, uh, about what they're doing. And I, and I wanna actually tell, share with you where I ask them to leave off. And so the, the idea is not that they are here to tell you a full story. A huge amount of success would be that we leave off with you wanting to corner them after their talk and continue the conversation. So um, the, the idea is that they're not giving you a full story. So if you don't think you're thinking they're not giving me a full story, that's the idea. Come up and talk to them, reach out to them on email or Twitter or whatnot and, and get that full story. Okay. So uh, with that, let's see, can we have the next slide, please? Uh-huh. All right, so it's not exactly the slide I was expecting. So with that, we'll, we'll dive right in, and we're going to start with Anita. And Anita is, is representing the Armstrong Company, and they, the corporation. And she has been working on sustainability with Armstrong for a little while. And she is going to talk about the leading ways that Armstrong is making environmental information, health information, more available to their customers. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Okay, here we go. At Armstrong, we're all about inspiring great spaces, great spaces in schools and hospitals, restaurants, offices. And what makes great spaces? Of course, great ceilings, great flooring. But also what makes them great is transparency, and transparency in the information on the impacts our products have on the environment, as well as what ingredients our products are made of. At Armstrong, our sustainability strategy is our Armstrong Green Print, and it is focused on key areas, but one key area, area where we've spent a lot of time lately is in the area of product and material transparency. What are we doing to make health and environmental information more accessible? We've created a new mini site within our website, armstrong.com transparency. It includes our product declarations, which are a transparency summary, has a recap of our EPD impact areas, like a nutrition label. It also has a summary of sustainability information, VOC, recyclability, recycled content. And then most importantly, it contains a material ingredient table that discloses our ingredients at 100, at 1,000 parts per million, screens it against a number of industry lists, green screen, and it does contribute to the lead version four material credit. We've also done some fun things, some education outreach in trying to make uh, some of this whole acronym of alphabet soup, APDs, EPDs, a little fun. So I have a, here a short clip that will play as to an education outreach on our website. When you're deciding on the best ceiling for a project, lots of acronyms are in the mix. There are NRCs, ACs, and CACs for acoustics, LRs for light reflectance, 
even STCs for sound transmission classes. The list goes on and on. And now, with environmental acronyms added to the soup, how do you make sense of it all? Kind of fun. I hope everyone had lunch. <laughs> So also part of our education outreach is a continuing education module on building product transparency, which our reps and, and it's also available on our website can, can be delivered. We've also taken our Green Genie lead calculator and we've combined with Eco Scorecard to be able to deliver searching, evaluating, documenting um, environmental information 24 seven and um, also including the new lead version four credits. We've partnered with our customers, we've learned from them. We've also other manufacturers, uh, standard bodies like ASTM, who's working on a product disclosure standard. Cradle to Cradle, of course, worked on many living, li living building challenge projects. And we've also learned more. We um, sponsored the Drive Toward Healthier Building Smart Market Report with McGraw-Hill. We've also been a founding sponsor of the US um, GBC Northern California Chapter Building Health Initiative, and we look forward to the Healthy Materials Summit coming up next uh, month, actually, in Cambridge. So we're here to celebrate Materials Data at Green Build, and we look forward to ongoing collaboration with everyone. Thank you. All right, so that set a high bar in at least two dimensions. Um, that set a high bar by if you, when engaging with a product manufacturer, what is possible? And so if maybe you are dealing with product manufacturers who may not be able to do that, um, it's useful to be able to point them to Armstrong and say, look what, look what people can do when they want to. Second, it was also really fast, so that was really good. <laughs> All right, so with that, um, Let's see, so this, this is the full lineup that we're gonna have in front of you. And, and so Jennifer O'Connor is gonna come up and, and, and talk about the Athena, her work at the Athena Institute. These guys have been driving an approach to understanding life cycle impacts for whole buildings, assemblies, and all sorts of stuff for a long time. They are, they are veterans in this game, and so they understand how to get people to think about buildings in new and more integrative ways. Thank you, thank you very much, and thank you for being here. I'm thrilled to be here with all these people doing such great work, and I'm really excited about the trend in data and transparency, and that's because the Athena Institute is all about transparency, and we've been at that for about 20 years as a nonprofit research collaborative and LCA think tank. So we work in two areas. We work with, uh, we help industry measure and reduce the footprint of construction products, and we provide a simplified and free whole building LCA tool. And we have a, we've got a vision, it's a long-term vision, but someday we'd love to see every building using LCA in design, and we'd love to see this kind of disclosure, transparent disclosure of uh, building performance, of environmental performance. So we are in the business of LCA, which means what we're after is embodied environmental effects, which are usually ignored because we usually think about effects over the long term of the building. And, and in almost every case, the, um, that counter's not right, is it? <laughs> in almost every case, the operating effects <laughs> dwarf, dwarf the embodied effects, so they're easy to forget, but I'd like to suggest that we maybe consider the urgency of some of our environmental concerns like climate change and that perhaps we want to think about the earlier phases of the building. This is the same data. This is a typical mid-rise building and uh, consider the tremendous environmental footprint that building had before it even opened the doors for the first time. So uh, we might want to bring down embodied impacts, but to do that, this is where we get to the tricky data part because we need so much data to do that, and then we need a fairly complicated analytical method called life cycle assessment. And at Athena, we figured that architects, engineers, and so forth have pretty full plates already, and so we thought, well, let's try and make that easy for you and package it up. So back in 2002, we first released our tool called the impact estimator. I do not have time for a demo today of the software, but I have several of my colleagues here on the expo floor, and I encourage you to go 
see them and they'll talk to you as long as you like. This tool is free, thanks to our supporters, and that's because it's our mandate at Athena to make LCA as accessible as possible. So what's up next for us? We're constantly working on that tool and updating the data behind it. The, the cool thing I want to share with you that we're working on now is benchmarking. So when you do whole building LCA, you have something to compare it to. Anyway, we collaborate with lots of people on all kinds of different projects, and if you're interested in chatting with us on how we might work together, I want to encourage you to come see us. Thanks very much. All right, continuing the high bar of both interesting and fast. So the, <laughs> so the, the one, one thing there, just, I love that slide of that sort of relationship between the, you know, the, the year one and the ongoing years. Remembering that you know, on year one we deliver that building, look at the amount of stuff that was in our control. Right, all right, so, uh, let's see. <laughs> Don't won't digress too much. All right, so, uh, yes, that looks better. All right, <laughs> all right. Roderick Bates is gonna come from, from Kieran Tigerlake, is gonna come and talk to us about some really cool new tools they're putting in the hands of design teams. So please come on up here. I can't start without my slide here. Ah, there we go. So, a little bit of doom and gloom, uh, to borrow a term from Tom Lent, is to, for all of us as designers to remember that every time we specify a material in a project, there are environmental impacts associated with the extraction of the raw ingredients used to make those materials. Whether it be the mining of metals, say, uh, harvesting of timber, or drilling for natural gas. There we go. Of course, those raw ingredients then filter into manufacturing processes, whether it be the smelting of aluminum or extrusion of aluminum, uh, floating of glass, that themselves will all then feed into another manufacturing process, in this case, a curtain wall unit that has rubber, glass, aluminum, all these sort of things that each have their own environmental impacts. And of course, at the end of a building's life, all of those different components are gonna feed into a recycling stream, hopefully. But of course, that might not be the case. It might actually go into a landfill or it might actually be incinerated depending upon the material. And there'll be environmental impacts associated with those processes as well. So you have all these different stages of a particular material's life. But how do we as designers get the information we need to actually account for this? How at every stage of design we're actually making decisions has some tool by which we can account for this and gradually lower the impact associated with our particular project. Well, the challenge is we went out there and we found there was no easy to use tool that was directly integrated into the modeling tools that we were used to using, a particular BIM. So in this case, we felt it was necessary to create our own tool. So we partnered with Autodesk, the makers of Revit Software, and PE International, one of the primary providers of LCA data, to generate a tool called Tally. And that tool uses of data, as I said before, provided by Pete International, but also includes a number of environmental product declaration that are product-specific LCA data. This tool is now available commercially at choosetally.com, and we've been delighted with the receptivity both in practice and academia. So what exactly does Tally allow you to do? Well, it operates within the context of Revit. It allows you to do whole building assessments as well as design option comparisons, and even the analysis of discrete units and assemblies and components. All that information is put into a framework that is easily decipherable and used to support decision making by designers with the results broken down by CSI division, Revit category, life cycle stage. And of course, you can't do any of this without knowing how much stuff you have in your building. So you can finally answer the question, how much does your building weigh? And in fact, how much does every subcomponent of your building weigh? And that's used as a direct input into determining the impact upon a broad, broad variety of categories in accordance with the EPA Tracy categorization scheme. These are the same categories, of course, that are required by the LEED V4 requirement. And on top of that, of course, we do primary energy demand, both renewable and non-renewable, which is the amount of energy that's required to produce these various goods, maintain them, and of course, dispose of them. So, I have a soapbox, how am I gonna use it? Well, first of all, we have an entire hall full of exhibitors out there that are making these goods that have environmental impacts associated with them. If each of you go and ask them, where is your EPD or your product specific 
life cycle assessment, we can incorporate that data once they generate directly into Tally to allow you to know exactly what the impact of your design decisions are as you model throughout every single stage of your design. And you can have certainty that you're able to reduce the environmental impact of your building, while at the same time we can drive the industry to reduce the environmental impact associated with the materials that they provide us as designers. Thank you. All right. Okay, so again, fast, quick, interesting. So one, I, I'm just gonna comment. So I love that last, I, I, what, a great, what a great thing to end on is, is saying, look, they've created tools, whether it's in Tally or an Eco Calculator, and they need some data. And, and we've seen a product manufacturer show that they can produce a lot of that data. What a great thing to do, a call to action to challenge other manufacturers to, to make that more broadly available. It's awesome. All right, so speaking of someone who's challenging, Nadav Melin is, is our next speaker, and he is going to come and talk to us about the work he's doing at Building Green and uh, talk about someone who has been passionate about making information about materials and building products more accessible and understandable for quite a while now. Nadav. Thank you, Chris. Um, it's great to be here. Well. As many of you know, uh, we at Building Green have been reviewing products and publishing curated lists since the dark ages when many people thought recycled content was all that mattered, right? Anyone remember this? Um, over the years, though, the industry has evolved. This thing called LEED came along. And so, of course, we evolved with it. We created LEED user. We added LEED filters to our database. Um, but we never let go of our own approach to filtering products because, frankly, those original lead filters were all about recycled content, regional materials, et cetera. They just don't tell the whole story, right? And all along, we've relied on an approach that I call informed common sense. Common sense told us that you have to look at the entire life cycle of a product. Green specs in just one area are not enough. Common sense told us that different criteria take precedence in different product categories. The top concerns for carpet are just not the same as the top concerns for a roofing material. And common sense told us that whether an object is green in itself is really only part of the story. The application and how you use it really matters as well. So the piece of information that we struggled with the most over the years to, as part of our assessment, as part of our review, was about product contents and toxicity. We turned to our friends at Pharos for help and came up with some pretty helpful references, I think, for the design community. Something distilled and simplified enough that designers could actually use it in their process, right? Spec this, not that. Can't get much better than that, right? Um, but the data to work from on these was rare and hard to find. So we helped convene some leaders in the design community and uh, created something called the Health Product Declaration. A July 2010 meeting in Seattle really kicked this thing off, and it's been a wild ride. Initially, uh, designers helped jumpstart demand for HPDs with a famous series of letters to their suppliers. Tell us what you're made of, or else. Uh, of course, it didn't hurt that Lead V4 came out with a credit encouraging the use of HPDs. Manufacturers have responded, and now we've got over 700 HPDs out there from over 140 different manufacturers and counting. So everything is hunky-dory, right? We're getting all the data we want, we're all set. Mission accomplished? Well, not exactly. Uh, now we're kind of in be careful what you wish for mode because designers who demonstrated demand for these HPDs are now trying to figure out what to make of them. All right, so the first step is to figure out which ones help you qualify, qualify to help you earn a point in lead version four. That's the easy part. The more fundamental question is, what are these disclosures telling us? How do we interpret them, along with EPDs, along with certifications, along with any other intelligence we can bring to the table to figure out which products are really the ones we want to use? That's the work that we at Building Green do every day in partnership with the firms and individuals who ask us the hard questions and share their lessons with us. So I hope you'll come by tomorrow to see um, our top 10 green products for 2015 the session on the expo floor and see the ones we're recognizing this year as the best in the industry for next year. And our next collaboration, 
which unfortunately I can't tell you about quite yet, but I'm really excited about, will help bring all this intelligence into a venue, into, out of the green ghetto, and into a venue where designers are already playing. Because we know that if we don't reach them in the space where they already exist, we don't have a chance of changing how everything is made. If we don't change how everything is made, we're not doing nearly enough. Thank you. All right, Nadav gets the award for the biggest tease, right? That was supposed to, the whole goal was to be ask, waiting, having you guys want to ask him something, but it's not clear that if we pigeonhole you, you can tell us what's going on. So uh, anyway, that is fantastic. So, all right, so our, the la here, just a little preview. The way this is gonna run, we have one more speaker. Michael's gonna come up and talk to us about a fantastic tool that the General Services Administration has been putting together the last couple years. Then we're gonna have a panel presentation by the organizations that have been leading this charge. Then we're gonna come back and do a few more of these, and then we're done. So that just tells you where we're going. All right, so Michael's coming up here to talk about SF Tool and the work he's been doing. Okay, so how do you know what you don't yet know? And what are the right questions to ask? I'm Michael Bloom, I'm with the Office of Federal High Performance Green Buildings, rolls right off the tongue, right? Um, with GSA, and our office works at the intersection of buildings and people. We created SF Tool to help partners, largely federal agencies at first, Build and buy green. There we go, there's the tool. Uh, GSA initially conceived of this idea as a small projects resource, you know, for the projects that don't fit the mold of those large mechanical projects with expert-led construction um, teams. But it proved itself largely due to uh, the team we assembled with Noblis Incorporated, uh, a robust, easy-to-use platform for collaborative information sharing. Uh, now equipped with APIs, social media, and a huge list of collaborators, many of which are on the stage with us today. Um, SF Tool is searchable, shareable, portable, customizable, and did I say free? It seems like it's a theme with all of us today. We just need this work to be done. Um, it distinguishes, it's, distinguishes itself from many of the other tools here because we're more of an information or data curator. Um, we are framing the data by a narrative from trusted sources. Uh, we want to prepare practitioners to persuade, try that three times, uh, to, tell, uh, to persuade others and tell convincing stories using data to make the case for non-professionals that are crucial to the decision making for every green building project. But how do we help them frame data? Do people learn through visual cues? Do people learn through material comparisons? Do people learn through uh, what you're seeing here, models of systems thinking and integrative design and action? The list on the side there that says system impacts is really our way of preparing folks to persuade somebody who knows nothing about green roofs what its financial benefits are, what their human behavior, financial and O&M benefits are. Do folks learn from um, procurement, uh, because they care about procurement compliance. This is the green procurement compilation in uh, SF Tool, um, which has already been integrated with the Department of uh, Interior's green purchasing uh, programs through that API I mentioned before. We also are able to show exactly what the current labels used by the federal government mean in slides like this. Uh, but it's not just products we care about, we care about services. How do we turn services not only into a minimum requirements game, but also the optional green practices that can make them truly high performance? Um, so those are ways of accessing data through pictures, through buildings. But we also realize that the community cares a lot about getting the right things right when it comes to legal documents. So we created an annotated executive order. This is the executive order. Um, on climate change, that without leaving this page, you can get exactly what we mean by action on the right-hand side without uh, needing to go to separate documents to put these things into action. Uh, our My Projects uh, uh, tool actually allows people to collaborate and uh, put in real, just plain English, what their goals are, and our algorithm matches that with uh, content within the tool. And uh, SF Tool, as I mentioned, has a uh, robust social media presence. This is our Pinterest page, and you might find some of your stuff here. 
Um, we also share case studies and stories whenever possible through the share pages. We can take this wherever you want. It works on every size device. And we have that API I talked about. But what's next? Um, this is the summary slide, but I do get to not tease you today in my last minute. Um, today, on the uh, expo floor, uh, GSA and uh, SF Tool team are launching the Green the Building game, the first ever green building game. It's a sustainable renovation game that allows players to see just how complex our world of decision making actually is. And if you're a novice, you can truly learn what you do not yet know. And if you're an expert, you can be challenged to excel. So come visit us at booth 2276 to see and play the game. And also um, visit sftool.gov to use this tool at the workplace and to educate your clients. Thank you. All right. So one comment. This is really being very geeky. I know that, that Michael said a couple times the API. I got to tell you that from the GBIG perspective, we are really anxious to give that API a test drive because it's super well documented. So if you're the kind of person that a well documented API makes you excited, then he's got a cool API. All right. That's a very small subset of the universe. All right. <laughs> All right. So what I want to do is I want to hang this slide up there for a second and, and, and ask for a, a round of applause for our first lightning speakers. Really thank them for their efforts today. It was really nicely done. We stayed on time. We stayed on message. And, um, and, and I, I, per what I said, you told you at the beginning, do try to follow them on Twitter. Say if you if you liked what you heard from them, feel free to to say something interesting on Twitter or to contact them um, by their address, which is up here. So that's the point. Is they hope they hooked you enough for you to follow up. All right. The next phase for us is going to be senior fellow Ashley White is gonna come up and, and invite the whole panel to come up and we're gonna to talk to some of the leading organizations or representatives in the leading organizations. Come on up. All right, thank you all for joining me. I'm gonna kick things off by introducing each of the panelists we have today and tell you why we've um, asked them in particular to uh, come and speak with us. So to my right here is Stacy Glass. She is VP for the built environment at the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. She's got an MBA from Duke, a background in organizational development, and more than 20 years of experience with private industry, nonprofits, government organizations, developing and executing startup strategies. At Cradle to Cradle, she works in particular with uh, manufacturers who are pursuing the Cradle to Cradle certification and develops uh, qualitative and quantitative data on impacts of pursuing Cradle to Cradle certification. Next to her, we have Lauren Hine, the director of the Green Screen Program at Clean Production Action. She's got a PhD in uh, civil and environmental engineering. She is the co-author of the Green Screen for Safer Chemicals. Um, she's an expert in applying things like uh, green chemistry, green engineering, design for the environment to uh, sustainable business practices. And she works closely with US EPA's Design for the Environment program, facilitating the development of Design for the Environment screens for safer chemicals. To the right of her is uh, John Knott, the executive director of the Health Product Declaration Collaborative. Now, his original trainee is in philosophy, economics, and political science, but he is actually a third generation developer with 40 years of experience in urban redevelopment. He's worked broadly on sustainable development, uh, with green economy, restoration of cities, and he created the city craft process for sustainable development and city planning. And finally, we have Bill Walsh, the executive director of the Healthy Building Network, which he founded almost 15 years ago. Previously, he had coordinated the energy, forest, and toxic campaigns for Greenpeace. He's got a background in law with a JD from Northeastern, LLM, and public interest advocacy from Georgetown. So thank you all. So why have we asked these organizations in particular to come and speak with us? Well, all of them um, are representatives from organizations who are working with us on our lead materials and health initiative at USGBC. 
and they've been working on a project that we're calling um, harmonization. And so they're looking at ways that each of the different tools and services that they offer can be a little more aligned to both make it easier for um, a user who might, for instance, be trying to create a health product declaration, who might be trying to get a cradle to cradle certification, who might be looking at the health hazards of uh, chemical ingredients through a green screen, and who are going to, for instance, the Pharos da database trying to find this information. By having them work together, we're hoping that we can create impact at scale. And that's really a theme of what we want to talk about here today, is how can we be working together to integrate our tools so that we don't have lots and lots of little projects out there, but that we're doing something that can really, truly have an impact on the industry. Now, the goals of our Lead Materials and Health Initiative at USGBC are to improve the indoor environment from a human health perspective, to reduce barriers to materials transparency, and improve the understanding of uh, health impacts of building materials overall, and to also bring materials transparency and product optimization into the mainstream. And I think all of these organizations are all playing a role in accomplishing these goals of the initiative. So I'd like to start out by asking each of them maybe to just give a really brief overview of what their organization does in case some of you are unfamiliar with them, but then to let us know as well if there are any particular advancements that might have happened in the last year or so with your tool. Um, and in particular, if, if I start with you, Stacy, um, can you tell us what's new at Cradle to Cradle and maybe tell us a little bit of what's going on with this revisions process that you're a part of? I will. I'll spend a minute giving you just a little overview of Cradle to Cradle. Cradle to Cradle is a design philosophy that proposes that we can have 9 billion people on this planet and we can keep consuming uh, materials if we design things right, that we don't have a, a, a consumption problem, that we have a design problem. And so it proposes that there's five uh, critical aspects to this, material health, material reutilization, uh, water stewardship, renewable energy, and social fairness. And so we propose that that's the kind of data, that's the kind of information that manufacturers should be looking at uh, when designing uh, their products. Uh, through the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute, we have the Cradle to Cradle certified a label, which offers an indication for specifiers and consumers about how much progress has been made on those five attributes. One of the most difficult, and challenging, and rigorous aspects of the protocol is the material health attribute. And we, to truly scale these ideas, we need to make that faster, cheaper, and more reliable, these material health assessments. And that's the reason, one of the big reasons, um, to partner with these other organizations who have the exact same mission. We all want to bring sustainable, uh, more uh, safe, healthy products to the marketplace. Um, and with that shared mission, we've started working on the analysis um, that, that took place um, about 18 months ago on what do each of our protocols look like. Uh, from that analysis, we sort of set a vision that there is a lot of overlap in what we're doing here and, um, um, and decided that together uh, we should be revising our standards more towards each other to increase alignment. So HPD revisions process has started, um, the cradle to cradle version four revisions process has started. And uh, through that process, we have Tom Lent from Healthy Building Network, Lauren Hine, and many other just fantastic experts sitting there with us um, so that we can end up with one inventory protocol one hazard screening protocol, green screen, um, uh, one exposure protocol that we can all follow so that a manufacturer that engages in one aspect of this can use that information interoperably throughout um, our system. That sounds great. I know it's challenging for manufacturers or for specifiers, any user really, to have all of these different acronyms, that alphabet soup that Armstrong talked about. So to have kind of a, a portal, a, a kind of a way to enter this without having to do so many, you know, report your data in many different ways, it's going to be analyzed in many different ways, I think this harmonization effort is really going to help create that impact at scale. So Lauren, if we go to you now, um, can you tell me, I guess, give our audience a little bit of a background about green screen, and then I hear that there's something called the green screen <coughs> store. I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Stacy did a beautiful job describing our harmonization efforts, and uh, green screen is a, um, a method for chemical hazard assessment 
that is really a way of pulling together uh, information to um, allow uh, people to really understand and communicate the human health environmental hazards of, of chemicals and materials. It's, it's, a, it's not rocket science. It's really about gathering and making sense of data and uh, communicating the value that feeds right into making better products. And um, it feeds right into a material health system. And it needs the inventory of ingredients that comes from HPD. And what we're uh, finding is that green screen is kind of a, um, an intel inside for these other systems. That, that by a, a shared inventory system, a shared hazard classification system, we can really build the base of a pyramid that allows all of this to grow and to let the leaders uh, rise to the top and but bring up the base as well. And we think that's really important. And part of that is getting the information out. The more information you have about ingredients, the better decisions you can make in product development and design. And so we've launched the Green Screen Store as a place where people can go to download green screen assessments that have been done by um, uh, licensed green screen profilers who are professional toxicologists. And um, at the store, you can search by um, particular functions. So if you're looking for a flame retardant or a solvent or a, um, a plasticizer or something like that, you can go to the green screen store and download many free and some for sale at a very low cost uh, assessment. And the green screen allows you to see um, a, an overall benchmark score a hazard table and all the underlying assumptions and data and judgments that went into that um, information to allow people to make better decisions. And so our goal for scale is to really grow that store and allow it to be a place that supports people in so many activities, whether it's uh, certification to lead product development, new textiles, new cleaning products. It, uh, this information is very much needed um, uh, in order to grow the base and um, support green design and procurement going forward. Great. And is the green screen store available now? Is it coming online soon? It's online now. Um, with uh, we've we um, it's been up for about a month um, working out the bugs, and we've got about 60 assessments up there now. But we do expect within a couple of months to have uh, several hundred. We, we oh, wow. think we've cracked the nut about how to incentivize the profilers to share with us their individual chemical assessments. That was the hard part, is finding um, a reason for uh, profilers to share this information. There's, their business model encourages them to keep things internal. We need to stop doing that and find a way to get these out in the world, but at the same time reward uh, manufacturers and reward the uh, professional toxicologists who provide this information. And that's been the hardest part, not so much the method, but finding the right model to get people to share the information freely. Okay. Well, that's great to hear that, that there's so many uh, green screens that are going to be, are already in the store and are coming soon. So, John, moving to you now, um, I've heard that the health product declaration is uh, coming out with a new version pretty soon. I know you've had a lot of things going on at HPDC, engaging with manufacturers. If you could give us just a little bit of background about the HPD and some of this exciting work that's been going on for the last year. Yeah, so the, uh, the health product declaration, uh, as Nadav said, was initiated 2010-2011. Uh, based on the concept that, you know, it's kind of interesting, as a third generation builder, we were taught that health was at the core of our value system. The idea, if you, we have a slide that shows the pulse of all the standards that exist, and the one that's missing is health. And when you think about what we do for building and development, the only reason any of us is in this room exist is because human beings need shelter to be protected. Mm -hmm. Kind of seems weird to me that we didn't have anything to look at health. That seems kind of silly to me. But... Uh, but there we are. And the whole idea was, that could there be a standard that was consumer-led, not industry-led, to actually create a way to have manufacturers report on their materials that are made for the built environment, all the ingredients, and then connect to a chemical database uh, that we work with with HBN to report on the human and ecological health hazards that are present within that standard. Version 1.0 was launched in 
um, November, well, actually, I guess it was February 2013, but the online data version was launched at Green Build 2013. Sin in the last year, uh, we've been working on developing, improving that standard, and that standard, basically version 1.0, as I think Jennifer Attlee and our organization so aptly described at our meeting this morning, uh, was an aspirational tool. Uh, and then version 2.0, if you look at our guiding principles, we talk about bold pragmatism. It's boldly pragmatic. It's much more usable. It's much more informed. It's informed by three aspects. When we looked at the global ecosystem of ingredient disclosure, we used the image of a coral reef ecosystem. And what we saw was something like 450 to 500 eco-labels, certification, assessment, screening, all these different systems, every one of them developed individually every one of them using a different disclosure system, every one of them using a different entry system, which actually made, we, one manufacturer I talked to recently says he spent $6 million a year, and they're not that big a manufacturer globally, to try and work with all these systems. So as we started looking at this, because what HPD was doing is just adding to the mix of another standard. So we basically have three roles now. We have the health product declaration, which is creating a tool to create a declaration on what the health impacts of these materials are. Most importantly, what we're now doing, we actually adjusted in the last year the HPD Builder tool for ingredient disclosure so that we could start to bring together the entire ecosystem of ingredient disclosure. If you put the names of all the species on all, uh, and the names of all the systems on the species you see in an ecosystem of a coral reef, you basically can't see the coral structure. But what would you do is you'd erase the coral structure and leave all the other species there. So I asked the audience, how well would the coral reef system work if there was no structure to connect the species? Anybody? Would it live or die? die? Okay, well that's what's going on in our ingredient disclosure world. So what we decided to do was try and become, move, could we create a way working with Bill and his group and these groups to create an entry portal through our system that would allow all the other systems to still be independent, but give the manufacturers a way to come into that system, do ingredients disclosure and support, and then choose where they wanted to go. Whether it be Farris, whether it be Cradle to Cradle, whether it be USGBC, Green Star, Level with BIFMA, any of those systems. Uh, and we are there. So version 2.0 is informed by that dynamic. And so version 2.0 is much more robust in its ability to ultimately support all those systems. Uh, it's not there yet, but through our harmonization work, we're getting there. The second thing it's informed by, we launched a manufacturer's advisory panel last November. I think we have 65 to 70 global manufacturers working with us in working groups that have been informing that standard. And then the third thing that's informed this standard is this harmonization process. And that's been built around a set of guiding principles of collaborative behavior that requires absolute trust. And every one of these organizations here, in addition to BIFMA, which has the level system, the Building Institution of Furniture Manufacturers, have basically opened the kimono. For the first time, we've all actually opened ourselves to all of our standards, all the details to the minus detail, and we're now working to align those standards so they work seamlessly. So you have a screening system, a certification system, an inventory system, a chemical database, as well as a whole manufacturing world that, of furniture that is now tied together. And our ultimate goal is to build a global collaboration for all of these systems so, that the, so we can work together to ultimately get to, to a built environment of human health that is not just for green building. Our ultimate goal is it, with HPD is when and hopefully in five years to eight years, our standard will be simple enough and clear enough that a residential remodeling contractor and his primary subcontractors and trade people can actually use it, specify it, and ask for it. That's an exciting vision. I, I certainly hope that happens. It'd be great to see that. Um, Bill, let's go to you now. Um, what's going on with HBN recently? In particular, maybe you want to talk about what, uh, what's new with the Pharos database and also give a little bit of background about what that is in case someone doesn't know. Sure, yeah. The Pharos project is, uh, was really the pioneering effort to drive transparency and disclosure in the, um, in the materials health space in the green building movement. Uh, we opened it in 2009. 
and it has three components. The first component is uh, a certifications library. So this is fairly basic but very useful for people to be able to look up whatever certification a product might have and understand that certification in the context of whether it's an industry standard or a third party standard, et cetera, and give the, the customer the ability to really um, drill deep on the certification that a given product or products have and understand uh, better the information that that certification conveys. The certifications really were the first generation of uh, uh, tools that helped us to identify healthier products and they've done a, a fantastic job to the point where we have many, many certifications and virtually every product is certified by someone for something. So now you have to really understand what those certifications mean. That's the first component. The second component of Pharos is a building products library where we um, are able to take information that we've received from manufacturers and independent research that we have done on the manufacturing process and present quality controlled uh, data and evaluations of building products against multiple health criteria. And currently we have approximately 1,600 products uh, in the building product library and the subscribers can search that library and compare and contrast products. They can set filters to um, help focus on products that best reflect their values. Um, and they can store those products in their own library for their firm or for a, a given project. The third component, which is most relevant to our discussion here, is the chemical and materials library. Where we've built a database of uh, over 35,000 uh, chemicals and materials, and the database screens those chemicals against 60 authoritative science-based hazard lists uh, developed by authorities, governmental authorities, expert authorities from around the world. Um, and presents a, uh, a, a reading, a readout on the chemical hazards that are associated with the various constituencies and ingredients in a product. And uh, this has proven valuable. We use it to roll up the evaluations into our building product library, but many users find it valuable just to be able to research uh, chemicals that they find in their products. Manufacturers can research chemicals they're thinking about uh, putting into their products. And what's been very exciting this year is beginning to tie this uh, chemical hazard database into all of these different tools through the API that we've established with the Healthy, with the Health uh, Product Declaration Builder, the HPD Builder. And the, the vision here is that through this harmonization work, uh, we are going to be able to make modifications to our systems as the standards are revised on both green screen and the cradle to cradle certification system to really uh, very well align all the systems so that using a standard format, we can really accelerate the assessments and the appreciation, understanding, and scaling of green screens, all leading toward product optimization, which is the whole goal of transparency and disclosure in the first place. I like what Nadav said about um, you know, the, the, the uh, grandfather of building evaluate, product evaluation tools, green spec, and the, the pioneering work that was done in the pre-digital age when we used to get folders, uh, <laughs> loose leaf folder sheets for, for binders in our offices, um, is that the idea of having informed common sense. You, you can't have informed common sense if you don't know what is in the product that you're evaluating. You can't have an informed discussion between customers and manufacturers. And the ability to have informed common sense and put this all online and to align these system, systems is really going to bring us together to point in the same direction on the optimization pathway. Customers sending clear signals to manufacturers so they really understand where to go with their investments in healthier products. And I, and I liked what um, Elon Musk of Tesla said when he released his patents for the Tesla <clears throat> for general use by all of his competitors. He said he reframed the issue for the whole auto industry and said I'm not competing against other electric car manufacturers. We are all competing against gasoline-powered internal combustion engines, which we must bring to an end in order to solve the carbon crisis. And we, as customers and advocates and manufacturers, are really competing against the proliferation of toxics in our environment, in our bodies. And together, if we align the incentives and the research capacity of the manufacturers toward the common goal, we are going to create huge new markets for everybody for the healthier products. So that's, to me, that's the real um, joy of this work and it's the real promise of this work so that our tools are not, uh, don't appear in the market to be options or competitors, but a continuum of tools where different ones are most appropriate for different tasks 
in different in different um, companies. So this is the to me that's the, the greatest innovation that we've done so far this year in Ferros. Great. So we have just a few minutes left, and I'd like to ask um, first start with Stacy and Lauren. I know your two organizations have uh, been working together quite a bit through this harmonization effort, and you talked a little bit about the technical details of how that's working out. But I'm a little more curious about what some of the challenges might be in working together, if you found particular benefits of collaborating. I know a lot of people, you know, a lot of organizations tend to work in their own silos. And so what have you learned from this harmonization process that you could offer up to other organizations to, you know, and incentivize them to maybe want to collaborate when they might not otherwise? Uh, so I think that John, John talked about trust and that we really spent the first many months really understanding and learning each other and, and building this trust. And with this trust and understanding, I can finally talk hopefully relatively intelligently about Lauren's work. And, I've, and I know that she talks um, very intelligently about the work of the Cradle to Cradle Products Innovation Institute. And so what's happened is when I'm meeting with a manufacturer, and it's my job to go out and educate manufacturers every day, when I can understand where they're at, cradle to cradle isn't always the right solution for them. They might just be getting started on this path to material health. And I can say, hey, start with a health product declaration. You know, really understand what's in your product. Or, you know, have your people trained by Lauren to do hazard assessment. She can go in and do that kind of training with this open standard. And so I can just very freely send people her way. And I know that people have come our way. Uh, from Lord. So I think there's this exchange that ends up to be a very healthy, if you will, even though we're all nonprofits, a healthy <laughs> business relationship, if you will. Great. So, I, you know, honestly, and as it, it was a little scary at first because we were each um, unsure about how this would move forward and um, doing the deep analysis and the comparison and um, going forward in terms of will, uh, will this work? Will it be accepted? Will we... Um, there are other forces out in the world beyond our intentions that may change things. But on the other hand, it's extremely exciting to know that Green Screen List Translator is built into Pharos that can be used by large manufacturers at their will whenever they want to uh, evaluate products and earn lead credits. And Green Screen Assessments can be used toward cradle to cradle certification. And what um, I guess what I'm most excited about is sort of to get this over with. Let's just get on the firm <laughs> ground already. <laughs> we still have a ways to go. And then start building what's new. I'm really excited about the future of how do we improve hazard assessment? How do we improve exposure assessment? How do we, well, we, we've got a small grant um, to do green screen assessments of silica and titanium dioxide mm -hmm. and carbon black chemicals that are everywhere in building materials but need deeper assessment than list assessments and uh, form specific issues. So we can, I know we can solve these problems that come up in the implementation of LEAD. We're all learning. And um, we can do it much better together than we can independently. Yeah, that's really true. That's great to hear how this experience has been going. And maybe just some final comments um, from John and Bill. I know that you've been working towards um, the HPD interoperability with the Ferros database. So what is that part of the collaboration been like? What do you see that's, that's bringing for the future? Well, I'll let Bill talk about the interoperability issue uh, and building our API and all that, and he can describe what an API is, <laughs> which he did very well yesterday. I think that, I think what I, I just like to follow up with when Lauren said, I think that, you know, as a builder developer in the, in the work we do, uh, the, which is focused on healing cities and, and building great buildings and healthy places, uh, you can't do that without collaboration. You can't do it without everybody working together, understanding the same common agenda. And I think that coming into this space, I think one of the most important roles of the Health Product Declaration Collaborative is actually to build collaboration and to use our organization to help create the, the behavior model for how collaboration actually works. And so I give you collaborative two, really pardon? means collaborative. That word collaborative and HPD collaborative. And it, and, and it requires putting aside your own agenda. It requires understanding what our common purpose together is. It requires figuring out how we all work together in just like creating a building. You know, you've got electrical systems, mechanical systems, and thermal systems and all, but they're they're all each important, just like our, you know, St. Paul says about our bodies, you know, it's the hands not more important than the feet, and the feet aren't more important than the head. We, and, and the collective, you know, I think the problem we have 
many times in this green building movement over the years is that each person, each organization for a long time has thought they have, they know where the North Star is. They know what the answer is. And it is my belief that it is only in the collective wisdom of the whole that we actually find what the future is. We have to be hu humble about what we don't know. And I think that what the biggest gift to me personally has been examples like Lauren who went out and gets a non gets a foundation to give her a grant. This, uh, it's, what's the name of the things you're doing, the chemicals of concern? The, diet, but those, the, well, she can talk about the diet. Problem the problem children, that's more my <laughs> level, okay? <laughs> but, but actually, and then comes back to our group and talks about bringing this resource in to solve the problem of these three or four things which she knew were the key issues across our entire system. Tom Reardon at BIFMA talked to me last week because they're in this collaboration and they're working, is it Green Blue? With Green Blue, and the supply chain is a mess. It's a real difficult problem. They're working on a whole system with Green Blue on digging deeply into the product supply chain. You all are doing the same thing. We have our manufacturing advisory panel, well, the whole working group. We're not gonna put those two together. But because they're in the collaboration, they're actually going out, doing this work, and because we trust each other and we understand each other, we're able to be on our own and come back together. And we've started to build really good friendships in this. And I think it's with that trust and friendship, we can correct each other, we can support each other, we can hug each other, but we can more importantly work together to get faster to the future of health for our built environment. And I think if we could all just get on that track and say that's our mission, it isn't about who C2C is, HPD is, Farris, it's about the future of our health. I've got eight grandchildren, okay? I don't want them to live in this mess. And we gotta stop competing and fighting and we need to come together as a global ecosystem with humility and respect, knowing we, it's such a screwed up mess. We don't know what, the, we, it's getting better. We don't know what the answer is, but we have to find a way to get there together. Great. Well, Bill, some final thoughts from you. What has this collaboration done for Healthy Building Network? What do you see it doing for the future of the industry? Well, in a nutshell, you know, for the future of the industry, the, um, the creation of the standard format for the information of the HPD a couple of years ago was a dramatic step forward. As frustrating as it may be in these early years to kind of shake out the kinks and come to consensus on the best way to report the, the science-based hazard information that we're, that we're trying to convey, um, as frustrating as that is, it's a lot less frustrating than doing it with four, five, 40, 50 formats. Mm -hmm. So once we get the format down, right. it really empowers all of us to get about the business that we really want to get onto, which is optimizing the project, product. The ability to create the harmonization process here where you see the elements of disclosure, assessment, and optimization all well represented and pointed in the same direction, that's another real breakthrough um, that has already advanced uh, the ability to use these data um, visibly, and the best is yet to come as the standards are revised all working together. The API that's now uh, been created from the HPD builder is going to enable all of this information to be communicated to all the, all the systems that we've seen so far and that we're going to see later this afternoon. It, the idea is to be able to provide that information to the people who want it in multiple systems in order to find the best way to communicate this to the people who are making the purchasing decisions and to allow the creativity and innovation of all those various systems to find ways to optimize the information delivery. And it's a constantly uh, learning and evolving cycle. Um, it's a constant uh, example of customer-led innovation and collaboration. And um, sometimes it's, it's hard to see what, what the future is going to be when any one of these tools that we're seeing today can easily access that information in all the multiple ways that they are gonna figure out to deliver it to the community and the multiple ways people will figure out how to use it creatively and constructively. And uh, that's what I think is the, the big message of the harmonization is the, the best is yet to come. That's exciting. I'm, I'm inspired listening to all of you and I am really, really eager to see where this work goes next. I, I know everyone else is as well. So let's give them all a round of applause for really working in, to create impact at scale. Thank you. Thank you.
All right, so we're gonna we're in the home stretch. All right, so we've been here for a little while and we're in that after lunch period, but let's remind us where we've been. So we started our time with, a, with our first round of lightning presentations talking about things that are making hopefully your lives or the lives of your customers better by making information more accessible. We heard from the organizations that are kind of catalyzing that change, and now we're gonna to run to the end of the program with another series of lightning talks, and these are gonna be just as quick as they were before. And we're gonna start with Greg Norris. And as Greg comes up here, I'm gonna tell a little story out of school for Greg, because I remember, this is probably five or six years ago, that what you guys may not know is that Greg was one of the driving forces in getting life cycle assessment under the hood of LEED 2009. And you're going, there was life cycle assessment? in LEAD 2009. Why, yes, there was. And, and Greg, I remember, I think on a cell phone at a cafe in Paris, schooling Brendan and myself on various aspects of something. And anyway, so he's been doing this LCA thing for a while, and he's been a, a friend and supporter of, of getting that information into the green building process for a little while now. Greg, please come up and talk, talk with us. Thanks, Chris, uh, and thanks, everybody, for being here today. How do we advance slides? I notice people have been doing it. The big green button, that's easy enough. Okay. Um, footprints, <clears throat> kind of a downer. We all have carbon footprints. We've got water footprints, toxic footprints. There's even such a thing as slavery footprints. How many people have seen, heard about slavery footprints? Uh, biodiversity footprints. And the thing that's, um, Footprint reduction is not enough because we can't get to zero. I'll never get my footprint to zero. Our organizations can't get their footprints to zero. Uh, most of the, the products we use, cradle to gate, have non-zero footprints. As, as Chris said, I've been doing life cycle assessment for a long enough time that I got that message. Um, so if footprints were all we had, the planet would literally be better off without us. And maybe that's uh, ecologically speaking, the, the state we're in, but that's not the state that we want to be in and that we need to be in. We've learned that buildings in their, in their use phase can give more than they take. So the inspiration t comes to us, can, can we as individuals live in such a way that we give more than we take? And can even products do the same thing? And I think we can because it's not just about footprints, it's also, we can also create handprints. Uh, Time Magazine got it wrong there by saying not. Of course, it's, it's either or in, in, sometimes in the press, but in fact, it's an and. We, we, we need to minimize our footprints, but we need to also create bigger positive impacts than the footprint we've managed to reduce down to. So handprints are measured using the tools of LCA just like footprints. Uh, they're in the same unit, so you can now have a carbon handprint, a water handprint, a toxic handprint. You can even have a slavery handprint. Um, and if that's the case, then maybe we can give more than we take. We can become healers of the planet. And so can many of the products, the goods and services uh, that we need to use to survive and to be present on this planet, uh, healing uh, one another and, and the, uh, the web of life. So imagine products that are net positive, both at the point of manufacture, but most importantly, to, I guess, to me, with my life cycle bias across their whole life cycles and across the full spectrum of sustainability. I didn't mention social here in this uh, slide, but of course, social equity uh, is part of the picture too. So this is what we're beginning to work on at ILFI, uh, a living product challenge to go along with living community and living building. So you can imagine, this is a hypothetical here of a, an image of uh, the future declaration for living products. But in order to get there, as we've heard so wonderfully today, uh, we need a, a data infrastructure that works well together. And the key word in this slide is all. I think we've heard it today that, that LEED v4 and um, EPDs and so many of the systems that we're, that we're working with and are a part of need that manufacturers are empowered to understand their life cycle impacts across the sustainability spectrum, that they can actually achieve life cycle assessments for their products at a fraction of the cost and time than they currently can, that it's fully scalable, uh, and that they're also incentivized to share innovations. Sharing innovation is one of the key ways that you can create a handprint. 
So as part of getting the Living Product Challenge off the ground, we're launching what we're calling the, the Handprint Generator. It uh, begins with a free downloadable tool, open source tool, with which manufacturers can model their production process in such a way that they can then tie to their ERP systems, enterprise uh, information about uh, details for each product, each SKU, use that to generate life cycle assessments scalably, and uh, also importantly, share that information into a, a pooling system that generates generic data. So, um, of course, come see us. I'm supposed to just uh, give an appetizer of the idea and love to chat with uh, all of you in more depth uh, at the ILFI booth today and tomorrow. Thanks. So Ashley was talking about taking this idea to scale, and Greg has been trying to get this idea to scale for as long as anybody, and so I, I, he's a good guy to follow up on and see where that is, that is today. All right, so the next is, a, is actually our first tag team. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have David and, uh, from BASF and Amber from uh, NSF International, and they're going to come up here and do our first tag team presentation, which I am anxious to see, this, this, uh, this uh, four-minute tag team. So Amber, come on. Thanks for having us. So if you want to develop products that are both good environmentally and economically. Sorry, can you hear me now? All right, sorry about that tag teaming. We got some things to work out. So if you want to develop products that are both good environmentally and economically, eco-efficiency is something good for you to know about. Um, and eco, uh, the term eco-efficiency was first used by the World Business Council for Sustainable Development in 1992 and um, eco-efficiency is a method of analysis to, to compare the products, different product alternatives for their environmental and economic impacts. NSF International developed the NSF protocol P352, the validation and verification of eco-efficiency analysis through a collaborative effort of sustainability experts, eco-efficiency experts, academia, and industries such as BASF. P352 is developed into two parts. Part A is the validation of the eco-efficiency methodology that a company will use to create an eco-efficiency analysis. And part B is the verification of the product studies. P352 is open for use by the public and BASF was the first company to have their methodology and product studies independently verified by NSF International. So eco-efficiency allows for balanced decision making. The eco-efficiency analysis is based on the ISO standards for life cycle assessment. However, a key difference in an eco-efficiency analysis is that it looks at both the environmental burden and economic costs of a product or process, whereas a typical life cycle assessment only looks at the environmental burdens. This creates better results for decision making so companies can develop products that are both with environmental improvements and that have economic benefits. So uh, thank you, Amber. We all know that there's plenty of data out there and there's plenty of qualified data, quantify or scientifically based data, but how do we use that data to impress or inform ourselves to get better decision making? So eco-efficiency analysis is a comparative life cycle assessment evaluation of similar products um, evaluated for six different environmental impact categories and 11 different indicators. And so as those environmental impact categories are then combined and balanced with the economic values or the total cost of ownership along the life cycle of a product, we can get better decision making and we can evaluate those both from an economic standpoint as well as from an environmental standpoint. After all, if we have the most eco-friendly or environmentally friendly solution out there, but it's cost prohibitive, is it really a sustainable solution? So eco-efficiency is good to know. Some of those six environmental impact categories incorporate things that we've talked about over the last few days and are very important to all of us, and those include risk evaluation or potential accident and injuries to manufacturing, placement, construction, and use of a product. In addition to that, we'd like to incorporate toxicity potential or what are the health hazards associated with the life cycle of a product from manufacturing all the way through use and recycling. We combine those into the eco-efficiency analysis and now we can see the overall impact, both economically and environmentally, from a number of different attributes in one final solution. So adding risk and adding toxicity to life cycle assessment 
is good to know. If we take a look at the results, maybe we can understand those quickly. In the upper portion of this uh, diagram, you can see what's called an environmental fingerprint, or more commonly referred to as a spider diagram. Each of the six environmental impact categories are an individual axis, and they're independently evaluated, where the lowest environmental burden would be at the origin of that axis, and the highest environmental burden would move to the outer reaches of the axis itself. They're independent, but one can quickly see amongst the alternatives that are evaluated where the environmental impact categories are most drastically affected. We take those results and we combine them into a final solution. We balance that with the economic impacts, and we put that on what's called a portfolio, which is in your lower right-hand corner. And if you understand the operation of a portfolio, you'll see that moving to the upper right-hand quadrant of that solution provides the most eco-efficient or sustainable solution based on economic and environmental indicators. So in this case, the green sphere is the most eco-efficient or sustainable solution. So, why choose eco-efficiency? Well, eco-efficiency is tried and tested with over 500 products that have been evaluated to this methodology, which is based on the ISO standards. Eco-efficiency provides a single solution balancing both economic and environmental indicators, including hazard and risk. And eco-efficiency is good to know. So if you'd like to know more information, please feel free to stop by either the NSF or the BASF booth. All right, so that one of the notable things about that is, you know, it's nice for, for, for us to touch on the economics of this argument, because we spend a lot of time talking about health and environmental impacts. And for many of our decision makers, that's the other part is important for them too. So with this, we have Jack Armstrong with us. And actually, this is kind of a BASF show, or alumni, a BASF alumni show. So Jack has a history working with BASF and, and similar companies, and now he has his own consulting company, Ackman. And so please, come on up. Thank you. Good afternoon, New Orleans. Well, I have to say that, you know, with Armstrong Flooring also presenting here, I must, in full disclosure, not say that I'm part of the Armstrong Fortune fame. And since we are, you know, in uh, New Orleans, I have to say that I'm not part of the Louis Armstrong fame. And uh, that's my attempt at jazz singing, if you can tell. And unfortunately, neither am I in bicycling or in astronaut fame. So I'm hoping to make it in the nano lightning round presentation fame. So we'll go from there. <laughs> Boom. So we've heard a lot today about transparency and people asking about things, well, you know, what are the ingredients? What are, uh, how are they going to act? Are they going to be safe in the indoor environment? And so one of the items that there's been a lot of discussion on is uh, single ingredient kind of uh, hazard approaches kind of a, a single filtration and a focus on, well, what are the ingredients in things? And we just heard on the previous presentation a little bit more about the multivariable impacts, where are they going, an overlay of cost, can people afford it, things like that. And what I wanted to bring to light today is a, a project that we've been working now for six months in a, in a beta version to actually start to overlay the thought about exposure. So what's the... Certainly we have ingredients and they all have a certain uh, footprint, you might say, but is there really an ability for any of that to actually touch the building occupant? So one of the items that I wanted to explain today was a quick example. So we heard in the material summit yesterday, and actually I think Lauren actually spoke about some of the other ingredients that are gonna be studied a little bit further. And take for example the, the titanium dioxide, the white pigment in paint. So it's as an ingredient has a hazard. If you're going to inhale the, the white pigment that goes into paint, it could be a carcinogen if you inhale that powder in your lungs. But once you mix it into the paint, which is kind of the, the final put in place product, that really is not available as a hazard anymore to be able to be inhaled in your lungs. So, you know, if you're gonna inhale paint, you'd probably drown first before you would actually say get get cancer. Uh, so that's really this thought process that we started thinking about, about tools in the marketplace that can help us distinguish those. So what I wanted to just discuss a little bit now is we have a, a hazard analysis set of tools that are out there in the marketplace and certainly available, and we have exposure tools that are out there and certainly available, a variety of different software. 
And what we've been working on with a variety of different products and industry trade associations is a kind of open source software bolt-on, you might say, to any of the hazard tools and to any of the exposure tools where we can have a common data entry that brings these two pieces together and then comes with a nice output that actually compares in ways and contrasts, much in a similar way as perhaps a, a, a portfolio eco-efficiency analysis that BSF spoke to, but in a way where you can actually look and see, well, okay, I know these are potential hazards from the ingredient, but is there any really route to exposure? So in the little swirly diagrams though, those are kind of the, the new pieces that our focus is looking for. And uh, you know, w when Bill mentioned earlier about this notion of working together collaboratively, uh, trying to weave together various softwares that are out there in the in the in the system that people are using, uh, we really felt like this is a, a novel way to try and marry different products together. So our goal is to really work with any of the tool providers that are there and kind of introduce this bolt-on technology that they'll be able to use to kind of merge the two systems together and give us more meaningful, actionable data. Uh, what I wanted to show too is there's been a lot in very recent years, a lot of great exposure data, mainly with the help of uh, the REACH efforts in Europe. And over on the left-hand uh, side of the screen, you see many categories, whether they're cleaning product exposures, exposures for cosmetics, exposures for dis disinfection products. And the two that I've highlighted here are in green, the do-it-yourself products. So you see, you know, glues and, and plasticizers and coatings, or the paint products, which are there in the, in the lower left-hand corner in blue. Uh, a lot of great exposure data to where we really understand, well, how do these things really act? And many of the companies that work in the uh, industry uh, are active in uh, other, other industries like healthcare, uh, cosmetics, and so we're able to bring a lot of that data over for products that are also in building and construction. So kind of lastly, just wrapping up, uh, when, when Stacy Glass had mentioned earlier this notion of, you know, faster, cheaper, more reliable, or, or someone on the panel, I'm not sure I may have misattributed that. The, the notion is to really allow existing tools to talk better to one another. And I think John actually mentioned a little bit of that as well. So moving beyond this notion of just single attribute, but a little more complexity in our evaluation process. So the, the ask for you all is, uh, if you're using a hazard tool today, uh, you know, ask that tool provider, is there exposure uh, elements considered in there? And, and if not, have them come talk to us and we'll, we'll try and introduce how they can work with that. So with that, thank you very much. Right, so we're starting to get a sense of the breadth of tools, and we are also down to the last two speakers, and certainly the last and not least, this is, ne well, next to last and not least is Tom Lent, who uh, always has thoughtful things to say. If you have never heard Tom Lent speak before, you will not get the full Tom Lent experience in the next three to five minutes. It is not possible. Although the information density conveyed in the next three minutes may be impressive. So, all right, <laughs> Right, I'm really sorry to, uh, to say that I'm not gonna fulfill the uh, doom and gloom that, uh, that Rodney mentioned. You know, you'll have to come to a, a longer speech of mine to find that, though it could be fun to talk about the exposure issues um, referenced in the last session, then we could have a lot of fun with doom. Um, so building without toxics should be, uh, should be straightforward. You know, you find out what's inside the material you would use, select those without hazardous uh, chemicals, maybe ask Jack about exposure, but the reality is actually not so easy. The uh, designers, specifiers, and owners are pelted with a confusing barrage of, of content and, and health claims that are impossible to compare. Um, manufacturers are meanwhile confronted with a jungle of different pathways to disclosure and assessment and claims, and we're making major strides, as you heard earlier today, in our harmonization efforts to organize and clarify this situation. But most of the effort still requires a lot of research and results in chaos, confusion, and frustration. Um, so harmonization needs tools, and one key element to bringing, uh, the, uh, bringing about order to this chaos is uh, easy access to consistent, thorough, and comparable information um, about chemicals and their potential hazards. And at HBN, we've cataloged over, over 3,500 substances in our chemical material library, and our pro pro uh, chemical profiles um, answer what is it made from, 
um, what's made from it, from that chemical, uh, what product is it in, and uh, what, are its, what are its hazards, um, drawing from more than 60 science-based authoritative lists for information um, on 20 health, uh, um, environmental and human health areas of concern driven by the green screen list translator results and reflecting the requirements of the health product declaration, all there. We also include the results of green screen full assessments, the things that, that that uh, Lauren just started to, to hint at. This is the, the deep dive into the science, um, looking across all of, the, all of the endpoints instead of just the ones that might have been highlighted on an authoritative hazard list um, to find, find a, a level of hazard for each of the endpoints and identify data gaps where they, where they are. All of this um, fully documented. Are we we're not moving? Come on, move along. Uh oh, this is probably where the uh, where the thing just ran out of juice. Oh well. Um, so our certification library uh, similarly addresses several uh, hundred different billing material certifications and standards, as as Bill mentioned, um, telling you what they cover and what they don't cover, and rating them when they address uh, address health issues. These resources are not just for Pharos. Um, we're leveraging our data and tools to support related efforts um, through the harmonization process and way beyond. But uh, an example really is the Good Health Product Declaration, where the Health Product uh, Declaration Builder um, uses Ferro's technology to help manufacturers identify the chemicals um, and find the associated hazards that they need to produce an HPD, something that would be a major research project uh, without, without this interface. And not only does the HPD builder produce the PDF forms that HPDs are, are famous for now, um, but is also um, generating data that can be transferred through that famous API and application program interface for anyone for whom that's uh, just a bit of lingo, which is a way for com uh, computers to talk to each other so that that information that the manufacturers have, have put into their HPD can directly be made available to, uh, to a whole range of, of other programs, including potentially even building information modeling system, allowing us to start to anticipate how we could visualize where the hotspots are in building, buildings and, and you know, enfold interesting exposure-based information into, into where we want to target our priorities first for avoidance of hazard. Um, interpreting these assessments, though, can um, still feel like a tough slog for the, uh, for the design team. Um, to help with finding and interpreting these assessments, we've now um, got uh, over 1,600 products in uh, the material library and continue to grow it now with new tools that we're rolling out to help, um, help the users of our tools invite manufacturers to, in, uh, to engage in the process and, importantly, to help manufacturers invite their supply chain in to, because uh, it's very hard for those OEMs to, uh, um, to understand it all, them, all themselves without support from their supply chain. And as we get more of them uh, converging up the supply chain, I think we're gonna see a lot more responsiveness and, uh, and, and get a lot more of the information that we need. So product profiles then, I hope you understand um, what is it made of, what are its hazards, um, are the contents completely uh, assessed with a green screen um, or with cradle to cradle. Uh, green teams will soon have the tools to deluge their, uh, their, their design teams and contractors with assessed products, um, which may drive them nuts. They may uh, be looking for a, a, a more uh, say channeled, um, channeled flow than the, than the flood of random HPDs, and that's where our team tools come in. Building on our experience developing systems for Google, uh, we're now beginning to roll out tools in Ferro that will help uh, to facilitate decision making, um, communication, and product workflow management for the entire team from owners to designers and specifiers to contractors. The green team can express its firm values through filters to develop firm specs and, and libraries. Then the project teams can layer on that using project specific values um, to filter into the actual building spec for a particular product and use this to communicate with the contractor, everyone being able to be um, part of the game and using the same, the same information. Of course, we understand, though, that it isn't quite this simple. You don't just divide, develop a building spec and build the building to that. We know there's a lot of complication that happens in implementing it out in the field. Exceptions and substitutions are also, and very importantly, managed um, by the process while we're learning for next, uh, uh, next projects and next, and next teams. 
Um, with the right tools and collaboration, we can build safer buildings. I encourage you to come visit us at booth 16, uh, 1638, right? And uh, see what we're doing and talk about what you could best, uh, best use out of it and help us uh, in evolving this tool. Thank you. All right, I like that on a couple of levels. That is the most condensed Tom Lent you're ever gonna get. It's like concentrated orange juice. I also like the fact that when Tom, when Tom says, and it's not just this simple, <laughs> and the thing has arrows and lines and railroad tracks and, all right, I get it. And then I, the, the final thing is I love the image that I'm sure that he, I, I, behind a bookcase in Tom's house is that library. That's actually a picture of his own like chemical library where he has his, own, his, his little bat cave of information. Uh, all right, so bring it, as, bring it as full circle, and actually, perhaps even, even in the spirit of practicality, um, Brent's going to come up here and talk to us about what Green Wizard is doing to literally sit somewhere at the middle of this and make it relevant to green building project teams, give them tools to manage this uh, simplicity, as Tom was pointing out. So, uh, Brent, come on up and take us to the finish line. Thank you. So we've already had some, this has been exciting. We've got some great presentations. We've had nine unbelievable teams come up here and talk about this. And I kind of want to bring the last piece of this together of how Green Wizard's helping transform markets with this data information. So let's see if we can go in here. There we go. Okay. So what I'm kind of talking about here is the life cycle of information, data, information, knowledge, and action. How are we transforming? What are we doing with this information? So. The first part of this is the data aspect. That's why we're all here. There's literally tens of thousands of places to get this information from. We're taking it, collecting it in the building product specific arena. From the next part of this is, you know, standardizing the format. We've all talked about all these sources, all these different formats. This is a big problem right now. So we're literally taking certifications. We're taking individual data points, documentation, um, performance attributes, sustainability attributes, all of this collecting in a standard format and putting it into something we can all use in the industry. So this is very difficult. We've got LCA data, EPA data, uh, EPD information, all collecting under one roof. So this is a great kind of summary of this, is big data coming into something we can do, information that we can now start to use. So the information portion of this is really kind of creating it in a, in a source, vast portions of this into something we can deliver and something that's actually we can manage. So information on this side is really the building product information. What are we doing with it? From the Green Wizard side, it's really searching for this information. Lots of different attributes, lots of different pieces, depending on if you're an interior designer, specifier, sustainability group, um, different needs, filtering it by their needs, filtering it by the manufacturers, the data points, the documentation, um, displaying this out in a format that can be kind of digested and used. You know, wh what do we really want to do with the information? Um, again, summarizing life cycle impact data, documentation of, of backing up all the claims that manufacturers are making. Obviously working with some great partners, Cradle to Cradle, HBDC, Level, Declare, everyone helping to get, move this information in a format that we can start to use. I love this image. It's really, you know, streams of data and then collecting it to a certain point. How do I need to use this information? How can I then use this information? So the, the third component is knowledge of this. Knowledge is obviously used to make informed and accurate decisions with this. So taking a little bit deeper into the knowledge side, on the Green Wizard side of tools, MR credit tracking, IEQ credit tracking, um, going into obviously you know, product health metrics, what are, what are we looking at these products, um, energy you know, dashboard for energy modeling, of what's the output, how's the building through the design phase, um, useful information and knowledge for the firms that are using it, the actual how, are, how did we use this product on previous projects from a library aspect. Um, the knowledge, getting into something that we can digest. We have to be able to use the information in, in a knowledge format. Um, action then becomes the last part of this. Actions comes from the knowledge we've gained with all this information through this process. It optimizes and gives us optimal results. Um, this is exciting stuff. For Green Wizard, we've uh, announced an integration and a partnership with RCOM. So a missing piece of this data is getting it into the specifications. There's been a big gap of taking information data that's really, really pertinent to these projects and getting it into the specs. Um, so taking the information we've standardized and collect, getting it into RCOM's tools, master spec, spec builder expert, letting this information pass down through the project teams. Um, of course, in light of, of Green Build, USGVC, our integration partnership with Lead Online and the App Lab. Um, taking information, taking all the information we've tracked at the project level with Green Wizard, taking it and putting it into the MR tracker, the IEQ tracker, sending that information over to Lead Online, 
really, really streamlining how that part helps with the entire project team. So data, information, knowledge, action, this is where we can deliver results. These results are really important to everyone in this room. This is the results for goals being met, lead certification, obtaining healthier, better buildings in our environment. The results side is collecting all of these stages um, and of course our certifications with USGBC. The last portion of this is kind of where we are going, opportunities and collaboration, a little, but really, really excited. There's an opportunity to collaborate and create a resource for those projects that are using HPDs and EPDs and showing and reporting what are the leaders doing? What are the best and the brightest firms and the people in the country and the industry doing? Let's start sharing that information and let's really understand how these buildings are coming together. That's it. Okay, Whew. Okay. if you stuck with us this long, you are probably a nerd. Um, <laughs> and if you're not a nerd, I hope that you have great appreciation for the uh, incredible roles that some very thoughtful nerdness is playing in giving us the information we need to make decisions. I realize the number of times we have used the uh, acronym API in the last two hours is probably unforgivable. And the level of enthusiasm used to describe an API is probably unforgivable. On the other hand, I think if you can take from that enthusiasm the idea that two years ago, we couldn't have done that. Um, a, some of us might not have known what that was, and, and B, we weren't rolling that out as something we could use. And this ecosystem did not, was not where it is right now. And so the thing that I would like to, I'd like to end with two things. One is, I wanna give a big round of applause collectively for these guys, and remember where to find them. So if you're gonna tweet something nice about them, or something nice about them, contact them individually or find them on the expo floor. So first, we'll start with a round of applause. And finally, I just wanna remind, in the spirit of our overall effort with Google and our partners like UTC and so forth, the goal, I think it's worth just coming to the finish line. We've been through a lot of detail over the last two hours, but in all that detail is something incredibly simple. We are trying to make our buildings healthier and better for the planet. We are trying to remove hazards, reduce risk, and, redu and, in, and minimize our impact on the planet. All of this information is to that end. And as we can start to see these gears meshing, whether it's the funnel of information coming together or that image of the guy crawling through the mud, again, there's all these Tom Lent images that, that stick in our head, we're getting closer to that objective. I don't know where we were exactly two years ago, but today we have more tools, more information, and more tools and more information are on the way. So when we ask ourselves, can we consider health and environmental information when specifying products? Yes. It's not a question of if we actually, there's no question if we should. We agree, we should. A couple of years ago, we might've said, well, I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna have to ask Nadav about it, um, which it, actually it works pretty well, but <laughs> it may not be entirely scalable. Um, and, and, but we've, we were coming a long way and we're moving very quickly. And if, you, if you're standing or sitting where I'm standing, I feel, you can feel this train moving out of the station and you can feel that it's not going to go, it's not going to stop, it's not going to go in reverse and it's going to pick up speed as we go along. So thank you for hanging with us. In the balance of our time, I'm really going to invite everyone, if you, have, if, if you have been inspired by what folks had to say, please come and find them. They're all still here. Um, talk to them and go deeper. And thank you very much. And we're going to close it there. Thank you. Thank you.